Oh, Hadley, I feel 18 again. Imagine tomorrow morning, Simon Ferguson is back on the set. And away from my reception desk. Yes! yes. <laughs> Please welcome Tim Curry! might seem a little bit odd. They love you! Wow. Yes. Thank you. I know it seems a little odd seeing that you're from England and all, and we Americans are celebrating Halloween and having fun. But Halloween has got to England now. I, I, I'm not really quite sure why it is. I think maybe after all that, that whole string of movies, Halloween movies, and, and, you know, TV shows from America, and so in the last 10 years, you know, you suddenly see English children with little baskets. Right, right. <laughs> So stuffing candy into their faces and ringing people's doorbells. I, I think it's rather good. I mean, um, I was always rather jealous, you know, when, when I was here and I'd see Halloween here and think, oh, why don't we have that at home? Yeah, mm. you know, exactly. Loosen up. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's play. Well, we'll Halloween, see. Rocky Horror Picture Show, I mean, <laughs> don't think they're going to go together. Yeah. I, t I, I sort of go to ground at Halloween. <laughs> I disappear. Oh, yeah, look at you. There's a shot of you there. Mm-hmm. Like the Frank Yeah, that would be me. Still, one of the greatest cult hits ever. Did you have of any all clue time. when you were doing that that it would turn out the way it has? Well, I don't think that, you know, anyone could have had a clue that, uh, that any movie would run for 22 years. I mean, it's pretty insane, really. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm very proud of that. I mean... Tim. <laughs> You're sitting here. You don't want to do it, I understand, but I really would love you just to do one line. One line from the movie. From the movie? Yes. Come up to the lab and see what's on the slab. Yes! <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you better cherish that because it's a farewell performance. Okay. <laughs> You know, when it first came out, it, it was somewhat of a flop, and then... It, it was a huge flop. Well, all right, a, I didn't want to really be there. It was a real old stinkeroo. Oh, okay. <laughs> what turned it around? Did people suddenly just get caught up in it No, there was a very what? clever young marketing man at Fox who invented the Midnight Circuit, really. Right. Who put it on at midnight at a, a cinema called The Waverly in New York. Um, and I was actually living in the block behind the cinema, which was sort of a bit grim. But uh, <laughs> it just kind of took off, you know. People started going at midnight at the Waverly, and then it, you know, went all over the country. And I saw it at midnight in New Orleans. You yes, did? Oh, swell. Yes, I did. Oh, well, swell. It was fun. Just loved it. Yeah, well, my favorite city. Oh, really? Oh, I love New Orleans. Oh, good. Hey, New Orleans. Well, you know what it means to miss New Orleans. No, I love it, and I go as much as I can. In fact, I have a great friend called Bobby Harling, who wrote Steel Magnolias. Um, and uh, we, we sort of go down to hit Mardi Gras oh, fairly yes. regularly. I can imagine you hitting Mardi Gras, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. I was actually going to be on one of those parades once. I got bumped. Oh, I'm sorry. By Jean-Claude Van Damme. Oh, see. oh, no. And you know what? It's, a, it's really fun to be in the parade. I'm telling you what. If you ever get a chance, to make sure you I, do it. Believe me, I know. Oh, please. <laughs> now, what do you think made the Rocky Horror Picture Show such a sensation? Who knows? I mean, I think... Um, well, I think it was a very sort of judicious mix of, of comic books and 50s rock and roll and, and pop art. Um, but more than anything, I think it's lasted this long because it's a, a guaranteed party on Friday and Saturday night. Sure. <laughs> and it's, a, it's, a, it's just as good a party if you have a date or, or if you don't. Exactly. And it's probably quite a good place to find one. There you go. There you go. There you go. Have you ever seen the movie? Do have you ever oh, sure. gone to see it in the theater? Yeah, I was actually thrown out in New York because um, they thought I was an imposter. Because <laughs> when I heard about it happening, I called up and I said, I'd like to come and see the movie. And, and, and the, the manager said, who is this? And I said, it's Tim Curry. And she said, you're the third Tim Curry today. <laughs> um, but yeah I've, yeah, I've seen it go on, yeah. That is fabulous. It's pretty bewildering. I, I can't imagine seeing you in there. Because, I mean, everybody else knows the lines, but you really know the lines, and you can really you deliver them. You know, the first them. person to talk back to the screen was Mark Shaman, who's a, who's a very famous um, film composer now, and Bette Midler's arranger, and um, he's done a whole bunch of movie scores. And he was the first person to talk back to the screen and start that whole thing. 
Can I say the D word on TV? Say it. Damn it, Janet. <laughs> <laughs> Tim Curry, don't go away. Oh, oh that was lovely. That was lovely indeed. Nice to see you have arisen from the dead. Rest in peace. We'll see <laughs> Back with Tim Curry. And Tim, I know you're excited about Over the Top on ABC. I am. You're working with Annie Potts. How's that going? Well, it's going great. I mean, um, it's funny, Annie and I met on a, on a, uh, uh, a movie about 10 or 11 years ago in uh, Arkansas. And we were playing a televangelist. Okay, where? Arkansas, baby. Okay, I thought I That's heard that. Exactly. That was very impressive. <laughs> I was playing the Reverend Ray, who was a, a, tele a televangelist, and she was playing my wife, Darla. Darla. <laughs> Darla. You do that well. I do. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was a six-day schedule, you know. It was pretty exhausting. And uh, we were in a place called Eureka Springs, Arkansas, which is a very beautiful town. And uh, Sundays were the only day that we had off. And we used to borrow this Buick, this big old bu blue Buick, and just tool around the country, you know. And we, we went fishing on Bear Lake. And uh, we used to cook up a storm in this hotel. We, we borrowed a, a, a toaster oven from from the local casting lady. Mm -hmm. And so we'd, we'd, uh, we'd grill this, the bass that we caught in the lake in the toaster oven, and then we'd make asparagus in the Mr. Coffee. <laughs> you know what? You we, had, we had great fish dinners in, in this the hotel. toaster and you... Met asparagus uh -huh. in the Mr. Mr. Coffee. coffee. Yeah, and hmm. Annie used to do chicken wings, too. She used to make the, the hot sauce in the Mr. Coffee machine. <laughs> Goodness. We now, ate very well in Arkansas. So what do you do? You just cast your neighbors? Is that how, you, how it works? Well, no. I mean, it's funny because we talked then about doing a show together. Um, she was doing Designing Women then. And then um, about two years ago, she started uh, preparing a show of her own. And uh, I, I actually wasn't available to do it then. And, and anyway, she sort of junked it because she did Dangerous Minds. And then I've been developing this show for about a year. And I always hoped that she'd be able to do it. But she was doing Dangerous Minds. And then they canceled it. I think three days before the pilot, and we just went. Mm. <laughs> Said, uh, we want her because, as you guys may or may not know, they're next door neighbors. Yeah, they're so next that's door why to I each asked other. if yeah. you just go and cast your neighbors. We're, we're, we're kind of a sitcom in ourselves, really. <laughs> in fact, we're planning to put a gate, you know, in the in, in the fence, right? So we can really kind of be Ozzy and Harriet then. <laughs> <laughs> so what would be well, the Fred and Ethel? <laughs> Fred and Ethel. What would be the the secret to your chemistry? I mean, the two of you working together and knowing. She makes each other. me laugh so much. Is that much. what it is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's. She's, um, she's one of the funnier women on the planet, I think, but also um, one of the kindest. Um, she takes friendship very seriously. And when I moved here, I moved here about nine years ago, um, and I, I, I moved to California at the end of a very long tour, and I was touring in Me and My Girl, the musical. I toured it all over the States, and I was completely fried when I got off the road. Mm. And she really kind of put my house together. I mean, she oh, nice. she just been doing a house in Glendale, and she sent over the carpenter and the painter. And the, you know, the day I moved in, she came over with this sort of dreadful patio set. And I mean, I didn't have anything. I literally didn't have anything to sit on. Or, um, and we just we're just great buds. But she does make me laugh, and I think that's more than anything what what the relationship. That's good. Is. That's very good. And then Tim, you know, you mentioned the play you were on the road doing. Your first play, though hair when you took it all off you were nude now was that just like a shock for you and then for your parents to come and see you just nude like well, that how nude stage? were you i mean you were nude yeah but you know i mean it was a big deal at the time because it had never happened before you know but it, it was it was so badly lit i mean you'd have to kind of peer to see really what was going on at least that's what you thought <laughs> well. no that's what i knew oh, okay um no it was it was a sort of cool thing to do i mean you know, it's something that, that, that you'd perhaps be more eager to do at 22 than I would be now. You know? Yes, yeah. <laughs> um, a little braver. But maybe. in England, you know, they have those... Um, I don't know whether they have them in American theatres. I don't think they have them in Broadway, on Broadway. But in the West End in London, they have these little opera glasses, little sort of uh, plastic opera glasses. They're in a little metal trap on the back of the seat in front of you. And you put in sixpence, or it's probably, you know, a pound right, now. Right, right, right. Oh. And it springs open, and you and can you take out the opera glasses. and and. Just before the nude scene, you'd hear this bing, 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 bing. <laughs> All over the theater. Everybody it was... wants to see. Let's get the clothes up. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's now, it's now. <laughs> and, then, <I> mean... <laughs> and your parents, they were okay with that? 
they, they, my, my mother thought it was hysterical. <laughs> she, uh, I actually put her in a, in a box when she came to see me, sort of a raised up box. Oh. Um, and I rather carefully put her in, in this box where, where Berger, who was the, the sort of lead boy, who wore a kind of leather loincloth and not very much else, swung from a rope onto the stage. <laughs> and I'll always remember her face as he came into the box and grabbed this rope. And she just sort of went green and pale. <laughs> <laughs> but as far as the new, new scene was concerned, she just said, uh, I didn't understand what all the fuss was about, darling, but I, <clears throat> it is extraordinary. I mean, you always used to lock the bathroom door so firmly. <laughs> <laughs> Now, did you did you spend some time in rock and roll as well? I mean, you, I you did for me, yeah. And, and what I happened? I did. Well, you know, when I started um, as in the the showbiz, um, I wasn't really sure whether I wanted to be a singer or an actor. And and one of the reasons that I did hair was a because I managed to get the job. I took my way in, into it. But it was also, in a sense, to kind of postpone the decision whether to be a singer or an actor. And um, and several people from the show um, got record contracts um, and were very unhappy. Um, because, you know, they were kids and, and in those days um, it, it was very difficult to get any kind of control over what the material that you oh, recorded. Oh, absolutely right. Um, it's pretty much standard now for people to have a lot more control over the material that they use. But then they could just tell you what to sing and, and you know, a few of them made some very embarrassing records. So I kind of put it on the back burner until I had, you know, enough power to be able to do that. Um, and I guess, you know, after Rocky took off, uh, um, I got a record deal and I made about three uh, albums at the end of the 70s, the beginning of the 80s. And I lived in New York and I, you know, had a, a band who were all sort of studio musicians and, and it was pretty swell. I, did, I just didn't want to be 40 and say, I could have made records. Right, I wish I could have gone on the road, yeah. you know, I could have been a singer. Could have, would have, should have. So I got to do it and that's great. I think it's, you know, every kid's dream. And then there were groupies. <laughs> there were, yes. <laughs> you know? The dream gets better. The groupies appear. <laughs> yeah, and I was still young enough. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, you know what? Thank you so much. Annie Potts was here. Having you here is great. Thanks, Tim. It's all over awesome. the top. Don't forget to watch Tim Curry Tuesday nights at 8 and on ABC at 8.30 p.m. Yes. All right. Trick or treating is not just for kids anymore. We find out the winner of our big contest next.